Greetings, everyone. We're excited to have you here for yet another installment of our speaker series here at UCLA's Center for Management of Enterprise and Media Entertainment and Sports. And I'm pleased to be sitting down today, although uh, remotely, with um, esteemed Anderson alum and co-owner of the Seattle Storm, Lisa Brummel. Um, Lisa, welcome, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, happy to be here. Hi, everyone. So today I wanna to make sure that we um, do two things. One, I wanna talk about uh, your career and some of the things that you're working on right now, but I also wanna talk a little bit more about women in sports. And of course, for those of you who are involved um, participating in today's chat, just know that we're gonna start taking questions at the top of the hour, and you're more than welcome to use the chat function to start queuing up questions in advance. Um, so if you've not done this before, if you mouse down to the bottom, you'll see that there's a little chat icon. It'll bring up the chat stream, and you're more than welcome to chat out questions or comments at any time. And when we get to the top of the hour, I'll swing back and start taking uh, your questions from there. Uh, but with that, let's get started. Lisa, um, there's so many different things that you've been involved in over the course of your career, and it sounds like you haven't slowed down. Could you talk a little bit about what you're doing right now? Uh, I, I always think I've slowed down, but I guess I really haven't. Uh, so I, I actually, when I reti retired from Microsoft five years ago, maybe it's more than that now, six almost, um, I decided I was gonna segment my time. I was going to segment my time, 50% for my family, 25% for the Seattle storm, and 25% for anything else that kind of came along that seemed interesting to me. And I, I actually learned that from um, Steve Ballmer, who was my boss at Microsoft, my last boss at Microsoft. And when he, you know, he said he really wanted to be intentional about how he spent his time and did, do the things that he really wanted to do. And he wanted to have a way of sorting what went in the bucket and what, what didn't go in the bucket. And I've actually applied that. Um, so I do my 50% with my family. I do 25% of my time with the storm. And then the other, the other split between board engagements, I'm on two different boards as an active board member. And then I'm on the advisory board of you know, three or four or five other companies, uh, most of which uh, the two boards I'm on, one is a startup in data analytics, uh, Domino Data Lab down in the Bay Area, and the other is Laird Norton Wealth Management in Seattle. And then I'm on a, a number of different startup advisory boards um, and one or two nonprofits. But I would say, definitely an advisory capacity, not in an active member capacity. Yeah, and so um, what does that mean? You know, you're talking about kind of put your life in the buckets like this, but it sounds like, especially, you know, thinking about advisory work, that that's almost an accordion. It can kind of stretch and spread to all kinds of other stuff. How do you keep it all straight? Yeah, it, in the, the advisory stuff is always interesting to me because some people always bring fun ideas and I do know better than to stretch my time too far. So usually it, it, I set the parameters up front. I can spend, you know, one hour or a quarter. I'm happy to do a phone call. I'm happy to meet in person if you happen to be in Seattle. I'm happy to provide a connection or two for you. I'm happy to review anything you want to send me an email. But I don't want to go to regular board meetings. I don't want to have to be obligated to do certain fundraising or whatever the case might be, because it's just more more time than what I would want to be. But hey, if you want to talk to me about ideas you have or problems you're you're having, I'm happy to do that for an hour, a quarter, or an hour a month, depending on the company. Right, right, right. Now, um, speaking of companies and advising, as a co-owner of the Seattle Storm, what does that mean? How deep a commitment is that for you? Yeah, it's, it's an incredibly big commitment. And, and I think every ownership group does it differently. The way we run the storm is in a very cooperative way. We have about uh, 28, 30 employees uh, full time year round. We have another staff that comes in during our regular season, season. when and if we have it. Um, but the three of us who own the team, the three women who own the team, we serve as a I would say as a board of directors, but also arms and legs to help with anything in the business. 
So we have a CEO who runs the business and she works with us. I, I will say she reports to us, but I think our relationship is much more cooperative. I, um, we also divvy up our responsibilities as board members. I handle basketball things because I have a background in basketball. I handle um, sort of the weekly or biweekly one-on-ones I have with, the, with our CEO uh, because of my managerial background and um, the others do their thing. But I probably spend uh, between, I probably spend 10, minimum of 10 hours a week in the off season, uh, looking at strategic plans. Typically from the board side, we tend to look out to the horizon a little more and um, try to balance what needs to happen in a season with what we want to get accomplished in the future. So there's a lot of two years out kind of discussions as well as, hey, you know, how do we prepare to get this sponsor ready to do this particular thing this season, whatever the case might be. So I would say relative to other board assignments I have, we're much more hands-on and much more active and hopefully we're much more helpful. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's funny, you, you kind of teased out this basketball background piece. You played a little bit yourself, didn't you? I did, yeah. I played in um, high school and college. And, and um, backbench player in college, mediocre player in college? <laughs> well, I was a pretty good player in college. I actually got drafted to play professionally, decided not to do it, decided to go to work. But um, basketball, I, I played a number of sports, and basketball was absolutely the one I loved the most. So it's pretty rewarding to be able to come back and do something like owning a team. Uh, never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that that was a possibility. But when it came up, um, couldn't pass up that chance. Totally understand. And I want to, you know, talk a little bit about how your career evolution has prepared you to be in this position, because it seems like, um, you know, we got matched made in heaven in the sense that you have a pretty unique perspective on both the opportunity and the impact of women's basketball at the same time that you've had years and years of experience as a manager at a company that was in growth mode and then kind of hit maturity. Um, and you're basically going to have to be a steward of all of that for the franchise. Um, can you talk a little bit about just any learnings or perspective that you feel like you can bring to um, the organization um, that other people might not have? Well, I think the way you characterize my work experience is correct. I worked for a large company, but I also, uh, you know, when I started at Microsoft, there were 4,000 people. So it was highly entrepreneurial. It wasn't the company it is today. Um, and the business with the storm is highly entrepreneurial. So it's really initially learning, you know, how to look for that next opportunity, how to evaluate it, how to decide whether to put it in the bucket of investment or take it out of the bucket of investment, decide whether you have the right skills or not have the right skills. I'd say what I learned at Microsoft, um, and probably coming out of UCLA as well, the analytical nature of business is really, really important. The people aspect of it, it you know, at least for me uh, and, and my style of doing things is also important. But, you know, it's analytical problem solving. On the Storm side, I'm very passionate about the product. and uh, honestly, at Microsoft, I was passionate about the product also. Uh, I don't come from technology. I'm a sociology major out of undergrad. But I, I, really was, um, uh, I really was excited about what technology could do for people. And I'm excited in the same way about what women's basketball can show to people both the game and the athletes and the business. And, you know, we don't have a business model like Microsoft or like the big men's franchises. We're, we're not anywhere near billionaires. We're not anywhere near the kind of revenue that they bring in. So you have to be smart and scrappy. And I'd say even at Microsoft early on, it was about being smart and scrappy. It was about picking the right investment, figuring out where you could have competitive advantage, trying to double down on that and trying to try to just run with it. And I think in, on the basketball side, we tr I'm not sure it's quite as easy to see competitive advantage other than putting the right players on the court so that you win. Um, the business itself is more, um, I'd say what we have done is look for new opportunities to build adjacencies to our original 
sort of core business. And I learned that at UCLA and I learned that at Microsoft also. So what kinds of adjacencies, what kinds of opportunities do you see for the club, for the league? Yeah, so uh, about six years ago, we uh, sort of right after we won our, the, the team's second championship, our owner's first championship, we started to look at the business and looked at what happened when you won a championship. And it's, it's a very positive experience for your P&L when you win a championship. But it's not the thing that's gonna sustain you for a lifetime. You look at it and you're like, okay, that's great. And then you gotta go do it again the next year and the odds of that happening are not high. We haven't had back-to-back -back championships in our league for probably 20 years. So you look and say, all right, what are the assets that we've built here and what can we do with them? In our case, we have a great event event presentation business. We find fans, we bring them to the arena, we make it a great experience for families, we play good basketball, people go away happy, and they wanna come back and do it again. So we said, okay, with these people who are working half the year, could we take that capability and do things in the other half of the year? And so we got in touch with the Pac-12, and the Pac-12, well, women's basketball tournament, like the men's tournament, had been transient. It would go from one city to another. It was in L.A. for quite, quite a while. And they were doing them back to back, um, thinking that they would draw more of a crowd if they had the men and the women playing in the same place at the same time. On the women's side, that wasn't happening at all. So we, we essentially bid to say, why don't you let us run this in Seattle and see if we can really make something of this. And the, the, the Pac-12 ended up paying us a fee to do that. Mm -hmm. We ended up with a six year agreement out of all of it, where each year we would produce the Pac-12 Women's Tournament, we take a piece of the ticket sales, we, you know, we, we really built a business around this, and essentially we were just cost sharing our staff from one part of the season to another. We went from that to, this, to winning our second championship and having a bit more money in the bank, and we decided the next adjacency was a three on three team the first professional women's three-on-three -three team because three-on-three -three is going to be, uh, well, was going to be, hopefully will be, uh, a sport in the next Olympics. And we thought there would be some momentum if we could start kind of having a professional team participate in, um, in tournaments around the world. There are sponsorship opportunities. There, there's all kinds of great brand visibility. And so our second adjacency came from there. We had kind of, I'll, I'll put them all in a, a third bucket. We've done stuff with the men's uh, rugby team in terms of doing their strategic communications. We've done back office business for the Seattle Reign, um, the women's soccer team. We've done work with um, the Ultimate Frisbee League in Seattle. So we've tried to find ways to take the asset that we built and spread it out over other businesses. And I think that for us is th those adjacencies have helped to balance in a time like this. While event presentation is still difficult in any COVID environment, we have a lot of connections. We can do stuff offline. We can use our assets to continue to try to keep a bit of a revenue stream going. So that's kind of how we thought about, hey, we're not just a basketball team. We're event presentation. We have a good brand. We can use that brand to build it out. We have good people. And it kind of went from there. So um, you mentioned before that you're advising an analytics company. Um, obviously, spent a lot of time in tech. Do you have any thoughts on analytics, fan engagement, right? Not so much on-field performance, but more about what you were just talking about, the, the business, right? And how you can use analytics to potentially um, get more out of your fan base. Yeah, I, and this is, the, the beauty of Microsoft is we have lots of resources to explore all those kinds of things. The right. bad news about the storm is we have 30 people, none of whom are really data analysts. Right. Um, nor do we have as much data as they would on the men's side. So uh, one of the areas, yeah, we, we just, I mean, the NBA puts all kinds of, stuff out there, measures everything. Their arenas are set up to do that. We don't often play in NBA arenas because it's too expensive. Sometimes we do, but all those analytical tools aren't really available to us, nor could we really, nor do I think there's upside in trying to make that investment. I think the, the, well, 
the way we get to people today is probably the most cost efficient way. That said, it's absolutely on the list of things I think are important, and I think we have to drive greater efficiency, not uh, not replacing the good work our sales team does today, but making them more um, more uh, making the reach better. We're really great with the depth with our fans. We can go very deep on fan engagement, but I don't think we can get the breadth that we need without some technological investment. And so we're looking at that kind of stuff right now. Understood. Talking about um, depth of connection with the fans, you know, one of the things that's been an ongoing question for me, and I've discussed this with other folks, is this is the really women's sports and how it compares to traditionally male sports, right? And how much kind of fan passion, but also from a monetization point of view, how much investment there is in women's sports versus men's sports. The most probably uh, talked about issue recently was with our soccer teams, our national soccer teams. But this is obviously. Um, something when we talk about NBA versus WNBA, um, the Olympics and so on. From your point of view, like what are some of the things we can do to start to bring women's sports to be on parity uh, with their male counterparts? So I, I think the quality of play is equal. I'm just going to say that. I think watching women's soccer and watching men's soccer, well, it may be slightly different, the quality of that experience for a sports fan or soccer fan is incredible in both places. So I don't think we need to do anything to the game itself, is my personal opinion. I think the quality of play at the professional level is exceptional. What we're not getting, we haven't quite found that proposition to media to get the kind of um, broadcast coverage and broadcast revenues that the men's sports get very difficult to wrestle with the traditional forms, the ESPNs, the NBCs, the Turner Sports, to get them to understand why supporting women is a good thing. It's very easy for them to produce an economic argument that shows millions of dollars being lost or going in the other direction mm -hmm. uh, because they just don't get as many eyeballs, you know. And the leagues don't promote as heavily as maybe they would if they had those kind of broadcast contracts. So it, it's a little chicken and egg, but at some point people just have to get on board with the fact that this is, women's sports are as interesting to watch as men's sports. And I don't know whether the environment we're in today, depending on, you know, who gets who gets out on the field or on the court first, whether they'll build a new fan base or not once everybody gets out of this or begins to get out of the post COVID environment. But I do think fans go away very happy in general from a women's professional sports event and media and broadcast isn't capturing that well enough. And we on the women's side haven't produced the right compelling argument to make that happen. It's interesting to me because I look at the, I 100% agree in terms of quality of play, and I look at certain sports, Olympic gymnastics, women's tennis, where the gap seems a lot smaller than in other sports, and I don't quite yet understand the, um, the ways in which the ecosystem treats these different sports differently, right? The, the, to your point, I mean, I think um, if we were talking 10 years ago about investing in digital, or social, right? Agencies would come to brands and say things like, look, you recognize that every dollar you spend in digital is really worth, you know, 1.2, 1.5, 2.5 you know, X, because that's where the people are. And it seems to me that um, with these sports, it's a way, it's a very unique way to reach fans that you don't have access to really in any other way. And I would think that there is a compelling case to be made and I'm still trying to figure out, you know, that kind of what's the, what will be the catalyst? Where's the opportunity? How do we close the circuit, right? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you pick two examples where um, the team aspect is less prevalent than the individual accomplishment and the ability to talk about one person, Serena or Simone Biles or somebody like that, where you can, mm -hmm really get your marketing and your positioning focused on um, 
on, on one entity and kind of get everything, that there's a super compelling argument in both of those cases that people want to see because they're both out of this world amazing. Right. It's, it's a bit harder to talk about a team in that way, a, a bit harder. And so you kind of then have to, it's like, okay, it's, there are these people, there's this team, there's this league, and you kind of get, have to get everybody to buy into the whole thing. It's not like tune in now because Serena's playing. Right. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just different. So it's, we have to keep working on it. And to the extent that, the, that people go out and get new jobs and all of, all of you graduate and have influence on this, it really is going to be people saying, no, we need to do this. No, we need to, to put some effort behind this. Um, no, this is important in a world we want to see women's and men's sports. Love it, love it. So um, obviously right now you mentioned the, the, um, the season and the kind of the main ways in which you monetize the club um, with the virus here um, and with lots of stuff being disrupted. What do you see as some of the ongoing opportunities for how folks can still um, engage fans, uh, find ways to generate experiences, even though we may not necessarily be able to do stuff in the way we've been doing it before? Yeah, I think th things have happened very organically. Um, you know, at the storm, we do a daily storm activity. So you can, you know, kids can learn how to dribble back and forth. Kids can do all kinds of exercises. And it's always a storm sponsored thing. And occasionally we'll have a player in there and they get on social and they try to encourage, you know, they'll, they'll blow it out through their networks too. So we try to get to the kids first. The second thing we've been doing and just got the rights to do is show classic games. So mm. uh, storm games that have happened in the past, we got our TV sponsor to start airing those, which gives us new sponsor opportunities to go back and live, kind of live through the the glory days, the glory days, which is fun. And we put media out there to say, hey, tonight this is going to be shown and the players watch it. And you can actually watch the players watching themselves play. It's a little weird thing, but they're on social doing live stuff. And so it's kind of cool to hear their impressions of what they were thinking in this game. It's like I was watching the uh, last week and we were showing a game from game five of the 2018 series. And one of the players was like, I don't even remember that happening. And like, and it was this really pivotal wow. part of the game. So it's super interesting to have players go back and see that. And I think that's engaging with and we run contests we run trivia we do um stuff out in the community to the extent that we can support restaurants that have been supportive of us and, and that sort of thing so we're kind of making it up as yeah, we go I along love the fact that you keep grinding um, oh yeah absolutely that, and, and and with that in mind and, and i um, i'm going to encourage you guys because we're getting to the top of the hour to go ahead and start chatting questions um this is for the students themselves you know um as you know it's not just the um, entertainment entities, the businesses that have been affected by the virus. Most universities have had to shift the online modes of instruction and particularly at our business school, um, you know, our students are in a, a tough spot, right? This is a time when obviously there's some e economic contraction, but in addition to that, if you're interested in careers in entertainment and sports, this would be the time when you would be meeting people, networking, interviewing for jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, any advice for the students in terms of how they should be um, managing themselves over this time when they're thinking about, you know, their career journey? Yeah, it's, so I'll say, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough. I, I know it's difficult uh, looking for jobs. For me, it's difficult because I have no idea whether I'm going to have a basketball season this year. And that's an expensive proposition, you know, not to really know and to have most of it out of your hands. I can't do much about it. So I, I feel for the lost opportunity for sure. That said, um, everything is a learning experience. So it, it doesn't really matter what situation you're in. This is an odd one and no one knows how to deal with it. So actually you're getting frontline experience. You're gonna know more than anybody else. You know, how to deal with technology, how to communicate with people, how to keep yourself 
uh, engaged when you can't face-to-face -face engage with people. You have to put yourself in a mode, a new way of thinking. Okay, how do we make this an opportunity? Because the world isn't going to go backwards. It's, it's just not. Economically, we can't afford to go backwards. Uh, practically, we won't go backwards because face-to-face -face interaction will change from here on forward. So I would encourage everybody to say, look, the, the situation is what it is. It sucks, but it, it is what it is. You know, stay healthy and look forward and start thinking strategically about what you do to give yourself the skills to participate, compete, get jobs, thrive, all those great things as you go forward. When you're leading a team five years from now, three years from now, whatever it is, and it's some combo of face-to-face -face and people who aren't coming into work, when you have to deliver something and you can't see people, when you have to deliver something and something breaks down, like you are in skill gathering mode right now, whether you like it or not. And if you put your analytical minds to learning something every day and thinking about yourself in a leadership position and saying, how can I use this skill going forward? What are the situations I'm going to encounter? Even if you can't think of it, recognize what you're learning, put it in your toolkit, and you will use it somewhere down the line. I guarantee. I love it. I love it. Now, with um, staying on that last piece, um, from where you sit, are there particular areas that students should be if they've got the time and they're sitting here trying to figure out what's next? Are there, you know, is this a time to become the master of um, analytics, machine learning, AI? Is this the time to be figuring out, you know, brand building, accounting, corporate strategy? Is this the time to be thinking more about leadership, um, distance learning, online? Like, what would you say, you kind of just from, from where you sit? What would you say are some of the things that you would think would be valuable and, and will be even more valuable in the, in the kind of the environment going forward? What I would tell you is take an honest inventory of your own skill set. Start with that. What are you good at? And be honest with yourself about what are you good at? And where do you see that playing out? Where has it been successful for you? What, where do you want to reinforce that? Then look and say, hey, who, help, who else has been successful? What sort of skills do they have that I don't have? and invest in those. For me, I'm not an analytical person by nature. I was a sociology major. I'm a people person. I love analytics, and I'd say UCLA was a great help in making me understand I needed to love analytics. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's something I need to continue to improve on all the time because I don't like paying attention to details, and I know that about myself. And so I know I need to push myself to learn things or find tools to help me build out that skill set that I don't really have. So I don't have the, you know, I don't have the one big thing for everybody because for each of you, it's going to be different. You want to create as well-rounded a skill set for yourself as you can because you never know what situation you're going to be put in. And in that case, you want to be prepared, thoughtful, and have some way of addressing those areas where you're strong and areas where you're not so strong. And this is the perfect chance to sit down and create that inventory for yourself. As an employer, I love when people know about themselves. It's like, hey, this is what I know about myself. This is what I'm going to be good at. This is what you can count on me for. Here's an area where I'm passionate about it. I don't quite have this skill set, but here's how I accommodate for it. And this is an area where I'm just like off in learning mode. And I'm going to tell you that right now, and I'm going to tell you I'm going to learn it, and I'm going to come back and be better at it. And if somebody has the willingness to come to me and talk to me about themselves and what they know about themselves, to me, we're going to go a long way. If you try to push me on how smart you are about everything and skilled, I'm probably going to look at you and say, you're probably right, but really, I'm not always going to be able to present you with your exact perfect situation. So my question is, how do you do in those situations when it's not your perfect situation? And that might be different than, I have no idea what advice people get when they go job hunting these days, but I'll tell you, I look for people who are thoughtful. I look for people who understand who they are 
and who are willing to learn and who want to do whatever it is I'm doing. If I'm going to hire you to, to do basketball stuff or entertainment stuff, I want you to love doing entertainment stuff or basketball stuff because if you love it, you're going to be good at it. Yeah, and that's the thing too, you, you, your point about the current uh, job seekers and the situations they're in is well taken. Obviously with the virus, um, the nature of intake will be different. The nature of screening will be different. Expectations will be different. Um, onboarding will be different, right? Now, I know you've had some experience, you know, dealing with a global organization where some of those things had to happen remotely. But even in those cases, you're talking about having some physical office that's accessible to everybody, um, even if it's not headquarters. Um, but, you know, thinking about your experiences um, back in the day at Microsoft, are there any, uh, you know, learnings from that time that help you think about, you know, what, you know, what it's going to be like for this next wave of employees with respect to, you know, onboarding, you know, hiring and so on? You know, I, I think, I think the companies that are focused on the future as part of their business plan, even before COVID, where mm -hmm. you, they, they have to really watch change in the future. The tech companies in particular, um, some of the more forward thinking pharmaceuticals, I can't speak to entertainment or finance or anything like that. They're going to be quicker to make the onboarding and integration experience right for people because they, this, that's the way they think about things. I don't know in manufacturing, for example, how ready they will be to do things differently. Um, their area of success wasn't built in that way. They have a very traditional and, and many in many cases successful way of bringing people in. But when those tools aren't available, I don't know how they will adapt it will be interesting to see. So I think there's in general gonna be a new wave of the use of technology. And I'll, I'll make a, this is a Lisa Brummel point more than anything else. I think for a long time people relied on having to see people face to face, like be present with them to determine A, if they were the right candidate and B, if they got hired, whether they were doing their job or not. And I think this whole work from home thing is going to prove that you don't physically have to see somebody for them to produce great work for you. And so as managers, I think there's going to be kind of a renaissance in how people will deal with employees and what they will be comfortable with in terms of how interaction happens going forward. And it won't necessarily be the same office environment that that we're used to. That said, I do believe we will always have an office environment. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's funny because I think about sales managers who have had to deal with this forever, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the sales force is distributed. Um, and, and one of my questions is how are we going to manage culture, right? In the new, you know, how does that happen in this new, brave new world where so many things are going to happen remotely? How do you uh, have, you know, how do you communicate the company's core values? How do you make sure that people's approach to dealing with their fellow employees and communicating and delivering fits the expectations of the company and the culture of the company? You know, normally um, we think about that kind of culture stewardship as something that happens face to face. How do you do that remotely? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the leaders in any company still decide what's important and they state it. And then in the interactions people have via Zoom or any other technology, written, verbal, uh, you know, visual, whatever, they reinforce those things. I still think there'll be a lot of things to celebrate. And you'll celebrate those, you just won't celebrate them face to face. Uh, so I don't, I, don't think, uh, I don't think the establishment of culture, the principles behind how you establish culture necessarily changes because I think it's just a narrower way of reinforcing it as you talk to people. But, you know, how you interact with each other online, how you, you know, do you talk over somebody? Do you not talk over them? Do you respect their point of view? Do you uh, disagree appropriately? 
Uh, you know, are you solving problems in the right way? Do you, you know, whatever your cultural principles might be, I don't, I think the leadership is really going to have to take it upon themselves to think about how they convey that and reinforce it when it's, you know, there might be a lag in the communication or somebody might not be able to see you or whatever the case might be. Okay. All right. Now, now that was partly a question from a student. I'm going to ask you another one from a, a student that I know well. Um, sure. She says, I'm graduating virtually next month. And my new goal in life is to bring back and own the Houston Comets. What should I do in the next few years to prepare for that? <laughs> uh, find a way to make yourself some money because it's, it ain't cheap. And uh, it's, it's not a great revenue producing opportunity in the short run. Uh, that's number one. Number two is understand uh, understand what you're getting yourself into. Much as I love basketball, my love of basketball doesn't make our business any better necessarily. It, it, you know, I mean, I have my opinions about what happens on mm -hmm. the court, but even, even I'm not at all an expert. The coaches are the experts. Um, and, and so you have to understand what your role is in this. And you have to understand why you're doing it. So when we bought the Seattle Storm. We did it because we believed it was an asset to our community in Seattle, both from a sports perspective. We thought we were adding great sports. From a female empowerment perspective, we had professional athletes who were in our city showing people what they could do. And because the city had, well before we purchased the team, uh, the city had embraced this team. It had a great following. You had customers coming through the door every season. There was a great excitement. They were spending money. So you have to understand why you're doing it. We didn't do it because we thought we were going to, you know, make this incredible business and then sell it for 20 times what we put into it. We did it because it was a community asset. So if you're going to go back and recreate the Houston Comets, Good for you. They were an amazing team. But you've got to have money. You've got to get with the right partners also who, who you can work with. They don't have to be like you. You have to be able to work with them. And you have to have a good reason for doing it. And you have to decide what you want to accomplish. At the end of the whole thing, what do you want the end to look like? And if you can say all those things, you know, go for it. I'm happy to help you do whatever it is you need to do to bring that team back. Love it. Love it. Um, and good luck. Uh, so next question. How do you view entry of an, an, a potential NHL team to the Seattle market um, and potentially an NBA team? Like, is, is that a thing that um, impacts your franchise at all? The market? Fans? Like, how, what, what do you, how do you look at it? Yeah, so I think we, we would say we welcome any teams, any professional teams that want to come to Seattle and set up shop. We want to work with them. Uh, we have a fantastic relationship because we'll share the arena with the NHL team. So we have um, been in, I don't know, we, we have, I'll say, regular meetings from the inception, from even before the team was purchased. We work with the city government. We work with, because uh, they own the arena. We work with right. the people who purchased the arena. So Seattle's a small enough city and a cooperative enough city that we have great relationships with our other sports partners and with the city itself. So we've been working with the NHL team to carve out a great spot for the storm, to support them in doing what they need to do, um, they were great in, in supporting us during our championship run and have been great cheerleaders. So on the NHL side, I can say it's very complimentary. We're going to share the arena. It's, I think it's going to work out really nicely. We're going to share some of their technology to your question early, early mm -hmm. on, where I said they're going to put in some stuff that they're going to let us use, which I think is going to be fantastic. I think the same thing would hold true for an NBA team. Um, obviously, when we bought the team, it was at the time they were just split from the Sonics, and the Sonics went to Oklahoma City, and we mm -hmm. kept the storm in Seattle. Um, 
again, I would only anticipate a great partnership if there was a team that were to be settled in Seattle at some point. Uh, we, we have a good fan base. I think, it, again, it would be complimentary. Uh, I would welcome more visibility for professional sports in Seattle. I think it can only help. Another question which is related um, to this issue of kind of complimentary fan interest. How do you plan to leverage the tremendous international interest of women's basketball to further um, increase the success of the teams in the league here in the U.S.? Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a great question. I'm not sure that we've really solved that one yet. Uh, right now, we have a number of international players that play on, I think almost every team has an international player, at least one, if not more. So we get a nice connection when they go back to their home countries in terms of the WNBA and the teams that they play on. Uh, our players currently go over to Europe and to China and to Australia and play in what we would call our off season. Um, they, so they bring our WNBA or Storm brands out there and, you know, we're exposed somewhat. What we yeah. haven't done is done the revenue connection or the marketing connection between the international market and our market. I know the NBA is just starting to do this or was going to start to do this with China. They had a game in Tokyo. They're, they're trying to do some things outside the U.S. It's um, it, it's difficult because those countries want to support their own leagues. And the Federation of International Basketball, FIBA, mm -hmm. has their own interest in what they support and what they don't support. Uh, so they're interested in kind of building basketball all around the world and not necessarily playing into what I'll call the USA dominance. So it's not as easy as just saying, hey, let's go set up a team in wherever, pick a, pick a country or pick a city, because there's a lot of government, political, sort of global operation or association things that play into making that successful. So I don't exactly know how we do that other than just having our players get exposed in different places. Well, that sounds like one of those sticky questions that, say, an MBA student project might help with. Uh, it could, it could very well. It could very well. Speaking of MBA students, again, if you would like to ask a question, feel free to uh, you scroll your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, um, click on the chat window, and type away. Uh, we're still taking questions for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you, thinking about your run here um, with the Seattle Storm, is there a memory or a moment that stands out for you in the time that you've been affiliated with the club so far? Something that, you know, you're pretty sure you're never going to forget? Uh, there are a couple of them, actually. So, yeah, I'll, I'll quickly say there are four. So, mm. sorry, I, okay. I don't have one. That's all right. Uh, so, the, the first one uh, was actually when we had our very first game as owners. Uh, it was in Key Arena, our very first home game. And... We had been doing everything behind, we bought the team in January and the first game was in May. So we had been behind the scenes doing everything. We had been fans before, but never gone to a game. Went to the game, sat courtside. People brought all kinds of posters thanking us for buying the team. I mean, you looked all around the arena and these people were like so excited. We ended up winning our first game, which was also cool. And the team came over and got us. So they, they walked over, got us, and brought us to center court. The players did. And, you know, that was like, oh, my God, this is – I can't believe this is happening. So we're standing at center court with the players who are thanking us for doing this. It's like, oh. So that was how it started. Um, in 2010, uh, we won the WNBA championship. Now, of course, you think about it. Of course, you think you're going to do it. and you know, it's just, but you don't have a frame of reference for it. And I remember our GM at the time, we were, we were in Atlanta playing the last, well, what was the last game of the series? Our GM came up to us and said, with six minutes to go on the clock, if we're still ahead, we have to go down to the floor. Because you, you got to be like, ready. Right. So six minutes, we're ahead. We go down to the floor. The ESPN cameras turn, like, and they're looking at you. I'm like, oh my God. 
we're going to win this thing. And so we win. And it's, it, that was like, again, another, you don't know what to expect until it happens to you. Um, the third one is, it's more controversial these days than it was at that time. But when you won a championship, you got invited to the White House. And so the next, when we were in D.C. playing our games the next season, we got our invitation to the White House. Barack Obama was the president at the time. Um, and it was amazing. We got a tour of the White House, and then you do a little rose garden ceremony. And so they tell you how to line up and all this sort of things. And so I'm going to get a 3A and 3B here. So 3A is we're lined up ready to go to the rose garden, and a woman comes out and says, the president would like to see you in the Oval Office. What? <laughs> <laughs> So we literally turn around and we walk to the Oval Office and he's at the door, he shakes our hand, we go in the Oval Office. And I think I was like, I didn't know where I was at that moment. Like I touched the desk in the Oval Office and I was like, uh, uh, like it's all of this history just, it overwhelms you from where you are. And he said some really nice things and he was, he was terrific. And so that was pretty emotional. We go out to the Rose Garden and I'm standing in the front row and they give a couple of speeches and then he comes back to have the picture with us and he actually stands like it parts right at me and mm -hmm. so he comes and stands on my right and I'm standing there and the first thing he does is it like he puts his arm around my shoulder mm -hmm. and then I was like do I touch him do I not touch him <laughs> right 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 what happens secret service is over here right <laughs> like he was totally comfortable with it I was like I don't know what to do at this point. So I I decided, okay, I'll put my arm around his waist. He is so thin. Like like I was like, wait, where is his waist? Where's the rest <laughs> of him? <laughs> so that was that was sort of a cool experience. And then I'd say the last one um was when we won the championship in twenty eighteen. So it had been eight years and we had gone through a complete redo of the team. Only one player was left from the championship team, and only one person in our front office was left out of 30. So we completely mm. rebuilt the front office and completely rebuilt the team. And to take a team to a championship after that and to be in the arena, we played out the fifth game of the semifinals in Key Arena, and it was sold out, and we won like in the last two and a half minutes of the game, and it was incredible. And it's like you, you see a whole cycle come right back again. It's like, oh, my God, we actually built this championship team. We didn't just buy it from didn't somebody else building it, right. it. Yeah, so those are pretty – those Ooh. those are my cool experiences. Sorry, I had sort of five there. That's okay. Now those are going to be four of my vicarious experiences. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to those. That's awesome. Um, the, the, you know, I think about and, – and this is one of those things – you know, which I find fascinating, right? So um, when you left business school and went to Microsoft, you're an individual contributor, right? You were a manager, but you, you know, um, you were starting really um, as an entry level manager um, with a scope of responsibilities in a field where, you know, because you were a poet like I was, um, that wasn't necessarily um, something where you had mastery from your undergrad or whatever, and tech back then wasn't what it is now either, right? Like we didn't really know what the future would hold. And somehow um, over the years, you were able to build success upon success upon success. And I'm, and I'm not at all surprised at what's happened with the storm over the years since you've been affiliated with them. But I just look, but that's because I look back at your career at Microsoft and you just kind of kept succeeding. Um, and I wonder if there's anything, you know, just looking back on your career to this point that you could share with um, the students about how do you do that, right? How do you, um, you, 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 I think you brilliantly laid out this idea around being honest, you know, with your self-assessment, but then how do you um, identify opportunities that you should pursue and ensure that you can actually deliver, right? So that those, you, you take advantage of those opportunities. How do you, how do you level up? Yeah, so I think you're giving me way more credit for this sort of, like, I planned this all out than, I, than is really true. I didn't plan any of it out. Um, and, and I think what I found at Microsoft, Microsoft was a place where I could, I was thinking today, like, I spent 25 years at one company, and then I retired. You know, like, people 
my grandfather and grandmother didn't do that, I don't think. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's the way back machine when you say you did that, mm -hmm. like frowned upon and all that. But Microsoft had so many different opportunities and I was pretty open to trying anything. And I'm not, I'm not afraid to fail. I, I don't, I mean, I've never been the smartest. I've never been, you know, the, uh, except for kickball in fourth grade. I was the first pick in kickball every nice. time. Aside nice. from that, not really the first pick. But uh, you can count on me to get stuff done. I'm also competitive. Not, not competitive with other people as much as I love a competitive challenge. So to me, uh, even if I fail, I feel like I'm learning something. And I didn't have a prescribed thing I wanted to accomplish at Microsoft. I didn't say, okay, I'm going to be in the C-suite by the time I've been here 15 years or whatever. I mean, who can predict that? I don't know. I mean, I wanted to do things that were interesting. I wanted to do things that were challenging. And I wanted to do things where I felt like I could contribute. And there were things that I, were better at, that I was better at and things that I was worse at. I, I wasn't good at all the jobs I did. I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll freely admit I was a terrible database marketing manager. I was just bad at it. Like, I didn't understand the customer. I didn't like the product. It was just, it was bad. It was a bad fit. But that's okay. I moved on to something else. And I know, okay, like, don't go back and do that again because you're not going to be good at it. And, you know, the HR thing for the last 10 years was just a weird oddity that was a reward to me to be chosen to do something like that because I had. Us, like the closest thing I had to HR was a sociology major. I, I had no experience. And then someone says, hey, can you come and be the head of HR? But I think it was because I had a set of skills that were needed at the time. They didn't need an HR professional. They needed somebody to connect the company's employees with the right programs so that the culture and the employee base could thrive going forward. And since I had the product background and I ha would have a good team of HR professionals, they figured I could manage those two things in a way that everybody could benefit from it. And it was a rough start, but, you know, it was great. It was and, great. And, and I'm sure that one of the other things that folks were thinking about at the time is that you were going to, you would be a great steward of the culture, right? I, I, I it's interesting, and I try to exp explain this to uh, folks under the age of 40, but there was a time when Microsoft was what Google or Facebook or, you know, pick your favorite thing is now, where the company was growing, it was small, we, we all knew each other. Um, and when we talked about how we solved problems, there was a certain common eth ethic about that and how we collaborated and how we communicated it was one of the first email cultures that we you know that you would see in a workplace that so many different things about um, the company that you experienced personally and then could make sure to preserve the essence of that in terms of the way we kind of stewarded the culture forward and and um, put policies and procedures in to kind of make sure that our people were being taken care of. You know, it wasn't just the fact that you were on the product side and could talk about well, what's the most important thing we do, ship product, how do we do that? But it's also that you were there, you know, when Microsoft actually became a company. And so those are the kinds of things that's funny because, you know, from where I sit, they're the, you said this in a different way, but I look at it as the kind of, um, there are the three hour problems, the three day problems, the three month problems, the three year problems. Sometimes managers hire folks because they want somebody who literally knows where the bathroom is and can come in in 15 minutes and just get to work. But in many companies that are growing and changing and so on, you need to be worried about folks who are still going to be valuable three months, three years, you know, 13 years from now. That's a different um, leadership profile and it, it requires thinking about those kinds of opportunities differently. And I couldn't have imagined a better person to have in that role, you know, her bumpy start be damned. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, it, it last, so, so uh, we only have a couple of minutes left and I have one last question. I don't even know if you're allowed to answer it. Mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that you worked with Steve directly, um, you know, and knowing that he now own, owns the Clippers, have you had any conversations with him and, and what is the relationship like between the NBA and the WNBA? Yeah. 
So there was a lot, there were a lot of questions. That wasn't one, but I'll try to break them down and give you answers to all of them. I think the relationship between the uh, NBA and the WNBA is an interesting one. Uh, the, the NBA owns 50% of the WNBA and the other 50% is owned by each of the teams shared uh, amongst us. So they are our parent and some source, fun, some funding source for us. So the relationship I think is generally good but it's it's hard to think about trade-offs between hey I'm going to invest a dollar in the NBA and invest a dollar in the WNBA. It comes down to who presents a good business case. So I, I don't know I don't actually know much more than that, but I'll tell you that. Um, Steve and I have remained close. Um, we have lunch every six months, and we agreed that we'd go we would go to each other's games. So he comes to one of mine in the summer, and then I go to one of his in the winter, and we sit courtside, and we talk about basketball, and we talk about business, and we talk about kind of what's going on. He's going to build a new arena down in L.A., which he's super excited about. Uh, we had a – I was supposed to go to his office in Bellevue this past week to see the model and have him take me through what the whole thing would look like, but obviously – that, that didn't happen because nobody's leaving their homes. Um, but we have a very good relationship and we talk about basketball a lot. It is something we both love. And I knew he was a basketball fan from way back because we had talked about it when I worked for him and I worked for him for 10 years. So we talked about a lot of basketball. Uh, fun fact, uh, we were each other's references. So I bought, I bought my team first. So I had to ask him if he could be my reference when they called to see if I was a legit owner. And then when he bought the Clippers, he toddled down to my office and said, uh, could you be my reference when the NBA calls to, you know, for, so I can buy the team? And I said, sure. Outstanding, outstanding. So, yep. All right. All right, well, we're at the end of our time. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, continued success. Hopefully the WNBA season is gonna happened this year and happened big for the Seattle Storm. Um, I hope that the students appreciated the time you shared with them. Um, but, you know, again, stay in touch, stay around. We're your biggest fans, pulling for you and continued success. Th thanks so much. And I appreciate everybody taking the time to, uh, to listen to the chat. Uh, I, know, I know it's an optional thing, so thank you all very much. I do encourage you to watch the Seattle Storm. We actually have two UCLA alums. Noel Quinn is one of our coaches, and Jordan Canada is, oh, last year was our starting point guard, and we'll get plenty of time going forward. So we're, we're always well represented by UCLA people. All right. Go Storm, go Bruins. And right on. Again. Thanks. Right. Take care.